let's see it's always interesting hello guys today we have the chronicles of teacher tay inside of the circle so i'm gonna go ahead and invite him in Hey. Hey. All right. Can you see me okay? The lighting's not like that great in this corner of my lovely apartment. So. <laughs> you look wonderful as always. Thank you so much. It's the pink, you know? <laughs> hey. Hi, everybody. Hey, Maylene. Okay. So I think I never know what my lighting is going to look like. Sometimes it looks great. Your lighting is pretty fabulous, Monet. Like, it's it's pretty amazing. And I also love that corner. Like, I think I saw the other day what you have. Is it like a plaque behind you? Does it say? Uh, oh, it's so cute. Okay, I think it's backwards, the or reverse. <laughs> so I'm like trying to read it as if it's flipped. <laughs> so I try to put a message up there every um, week mm -hmm. that I want to meditate on or I want to, like, encourage myself with like what needs to be yes. my face you know mm -hmm. so, I really really do i gotta change it today. i got my word today and i was like all right it's time to change yes i love that that's awesome so are you excited about the conversation i am so excited well first of all thank you for having me on here i am a fan of yours i don't know if i've told you that yet i'm a huge fan of yours um but yes i'm so excited and i love the teacher circle i think this is awesome so Thank you. Yeah. I did to talk with you because you're actually my first specials teacher. So I've never really talked to anyone that taught mat, um, art or um, PE or music or robotics. Mm -hmm. like all of the electives that we have, I've mm -hmm. never been like the teacher before. So I'm just so excited to like pick your brain and get yes. your perspective. I'm here. I'm ready. Yes. Let's do it. So I want to start with an interesting fact. So introduce yourself and then give us one fact about you. I'm ready for this. Okay. I Okay, so I'm Taylor, everybody. And I am an elementary general music teacher from Massachusetts. So I live on the East Coast and even Eastern Massachusetts. So an interesting fact about me. Okay, this is super random, but I think it's interesting. I am literally obsessed with goat cheese. Is that weird? I'm sorry. That is one of my favorite things to have. I can put it on everything. Super random fact, but you know what? It's important still. <laughs> wow. I don't think I've ever eaten it. I think I can't get past the texture. Cause isn't you know it what? Yeah, no, that's super valid. It's such a textural thing. So when I was literally in the, th I was eight years old and my dad was making breakfast and he was like, look at some goat cheese. And I was like, bah, goat cheese, like what? Like I was so turned off by it. And he was like, just try it. And I was like, Oh my gosh, it's been true love ever since. So, you know. <laughs> but, but I know you must be healthy because, yeah, yeah, no. Uh, I'm doing my best. I've been, you know what? I've been doing a lot of DoorDash recently. Like, since we've been in quarantine, I have plenty of time to cook, but I choose not to. And that's a problem. So, my bank account is suffering right now. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. Oh, good. So, what can you do? Let's talk a little bit about the importance of music education. Yes. And oh my gosh. Someone who I, I use music as an outlet. I use it as an outlet and a, a form of expression. So to me, I feel like students need that opportunity to see if, you know, they're great at it. Like, is this my passion? I don't know if this is my passion if no one ever presents me with an instrument or allows me to sing or, you know, I don't know if I have an ear if I don't quite have that experience inside of the classroom mm -hmm. and for many of our students you know their parents can't afford individual lessons or individual or extracurricular activities mm -hmm. so I feel like that's one of the main reasons why it's so important that they get that exposure inside of the school where it's free it can be trusted it's going to be high quality um, <laughs> the students a place of expression Mm, absolutely. So all of those things, absolutely. I mean, oh my gosh, I could go on for hours about this. I am so passionate about that. I really think, uh, even when you look at the broader picture, and then I'll zoom in on music, but music, art, PE, I mean, PE, thankfully, in Massachusetts, at least, it is, uh, it's required by law. The students have to have it. It's not the same for art and music. Um, 
I think it's a right of the students. And while we do want to expose them to see if they, yeah, if maybe they have a liking towards it, absolutely. We always want to encourage that. But, you know, if we even think about in this time of quarantine and many other things, uh, what do we turn to? We turn to music. We turn to art. It is therapy for us. And music really becomes a form of therapy for people. So I also am a huge believer that music uh, is a community-driven art form. So there's nothing like being able to make music together. Uh, and it provides a sense of community. So I think it's important to have in the school for that sense. But like you said, I mean, it is a creative and expressive release for students. They all need to have it in their school. Um, and, you know, I mean, people oftentimes are they're like, oh, they can have it outside of school. It's not the same. And it's not that we're necessarily like, not, like, you know, fully academic. Of course, we want literacy in the music classroom. But it's about more than that. It's expression. And for many students, this is the outlet that becomes what they hold on to. Whether or not they, you know, go into a career with music, it's like, you know, kind of beside the point. I mean, that's great if they do. But you want them to have that experience and that outlet. And it, it becomes it becomes something that allows students to blossom like I've never seen. When I first came to, so I'm in my third year, I'm finishing up my third year. And when I first came to my school, I had um, like the group that was really like my heart and soul was my third graders because they're, they're old enough where you can do some more stuff with them, but they're not really, you know, quite at that point where they're like, eh, you know, <laughs> so it's, it's fun and it's a cool dynamic. And they were able to hold that love of it all the way up until they left. Well, I mean, the year kind of got, cut short there, but until they left in fifth grade. But I watched some of my quietest students decide to take a chance in the musical or decide to take a chance in chorus. And you could just see the love of it start to flow inside of them. There's something to be said about singing and making music or playing an instrument and experiencing it in a very kinesthetic way. And mm -hmm. it's very powerful for students. And I think that a lot of them, like you said, they might not realize how much they love it. They mm -hmm. might not, they actually, Correction, they will not realize how much they love it until they do it. And it really affects them in, in a very special way. So there's so many reasons why I think it just, I mean, kids have a right to it. You know, I just think it's a right included. We're learning so many things in school. And, and part of music education is also like developing students to become citizens of this world. I mean, it's a community driven art. And I just really believe that. And I just, it's heartbreaking that it's looking at being cut in some districts. It's so sad. Right. And I always think, um, I always wonder who do the districts consult when they're trying to make certain decisions that would have such an impact, you know, because for me to hear that, you know, one of the first things to get cut is, you know, the music teacher or the art teacher mm -hmm. is like, did you ask? Did you, mm -hmm. did you talk to somebody and say, well, what is another option? How can we go about doing this? What all do they really need? Like, did you give them an option of maybe, you know, we can't buy all of these resources for your professional. We can't really pay you, you know, but to just get rid of it all together. Um, <sighs> this feel like it sends the message that this is a priority that students need in their um, experience in the classroom. And like mm -hmm. you said, I do feel like it is um, a crucial expression within the community, the community of the school, because I'll tell a student as a reading teacher, I'll say, okay, guys, we're going to write today, or we're going to write narrative today. And if they didn't have, you know, that step-by-step -step, um, brainstorm or a graphic organizer, they'll literally just sit there like, um, I don't know what to write. But then they'll go to music class and the teacher say, okay, today we're going to write a song or we're going to, you know, do something with the expression of writing. And those kids are just pouring out uh, lyrics or they're pouring out, you know, rhymes and they're just, you know, they're just free. Like, I feel like that's a safe place for them. So I'm just really wondering uh, what else could have been a solution besides, you know, the employment of crucial people to teach to, to certain students. Absolutely. And thank you for saying crucial. I, you know, it's, it's, there's oftentimes a little bit of a stigma within the education uh, feel like it, within buildings and districts that, you know, sometimes, you know, like music or art or physical education teachers are just less than, you know, they're just kind of in like a different category. And I just believe, you know, we, we all have a crucial part in the school. So, you know, and I, and I thought the same thing. I'm very lucky to work in a district that kind of does what you suggested, which was they said, we do not want to get rid of programs that we built up. So the district I'm in kind of worked for pretty much over the past 10 years 
to, I mean, significantly grow their music and art department. So we actually have a, a VPA boss, which is so cool, uh, which I love. And so he was hired about 10 years ago when they've really built it up. And I just wish other districts would like take note of it, you know, because it's just awful. I've seen districts, you know, literally, I mean, a couple miles away, you know, a town or two away, that all of a sudden their budget exploded. They're like, yep, all art teachers, all music teachers, if you guys are gone for now. And it's like, what? <laughs> like, is there anything else? Like any any other way that we can make it work? So it's so sad. And I just, I, I guess I just keep going back to this narrative in my mind that um, everything that's happening right now is traumatic. And it is traumatic for children. And change is trauma. And it's a form of trauma. And I don't think a lot of people know that or realize that. And it really is. And, and you know, we as human beings, we, we tend to resist change. So when young children who are just developing and look for that safety and security and even just as simple as routine, when that is stripped away from them and they return to school and it looks nothing like they, expect, they had before, even if we're wearing, I mean, God knows what we're going to be doing in the fall, you know, whatever it looks like, I mean, why pull away their teachers who are their support systems? You know, I mean, oh my gosh. So it's, huh, there's so many pieces to that. And I agree with you as well. I wonder who they consulted or rather yes. who did they not consult because someone would have let that not happen. <laughs> you know what I mean? We had a district uh, about a half hour away. They cut all music, art and PE teachers. That's like a hundred staff members. They just come. And it was like, what? Ah, <laughs> like that's all they right. got. Oh my gosh. So that's and who knows? how long they have been investing um, their heart into that profession and how many connections they have within the school. Like you said, kids are going to, you know, possibly be returning in the fall and they're going to be looking for familiar faces. They're going to be looking for familiar comforts. And so I think it will be like an extra blow to know that your favorite art teacher or your favorite music teacher or your role model within the <laughs> building um, isn't there and so I, I just, I don't know, it's kind of heartbreaking because then too, I think it goes on the perspective. Like you show people what they mean to you by how you treat them. And that to me is like saying, well, you really weren't that important anyway. It may not be what they're trying to say. I don't want the words to any uh, superintendent's mouth or any board member's mouth, but it's just, you know, just to be on the, on the first, on the front of the first cut. You know, yeah. and I, I, you know, and I love what you just, I love the word investment. You know, I mean, we as educators, it's not, it's not a year to year, like, oh, we just have our students, like we're investing ourselves into the school. And part of my investment, you know, is building a community. I have a real, um, I'm, I'm so thankful that I get to see every student in the school. It's pretty incredible. And then you watch them grow up from year to year. It is the most special thing. And it is heartbreaking when to even consider that you would want to get rid of a staff member that has that opportunity to possibly impact students on a year to year basis, you know, because sometimes we worry about students from year to year, you know, for various different reasons. And to have some level, like you said, of consistency is huge. But, you know, part of part of the specialists um, are that they do provide a sense of community in the school. And that's really, I feel like the biggest piece of our job. And I'll share just one thing I had, ah, it kills me. In the fall, I think it was in December, uh, we have this big sing along right before our holiday break. And so we have every student in the school come together. They're wearing pajamas, whatever, it's super fun. We sang this song called Unique. And the lyrics were, I'm brave, I'm strong, I'm loved, I'm smart, and I'm unique. And I will tell you, it was the most powerful thing having 400 students, K to five, in a building, stand up together and just sing. And right. I've never felt a sense of community like that before. And I think even small moments like that change our students' perspectives, mm -hmm. give them a sense of unity and they will remember it. And I think that that's just huge. That's huge. Right. It is. Yeah. So how did you second. teach remotely when once they close? Oh, you're fine. Uh, once they close the building um, back in March, um, mm -hmm. how did you continue for your students? Yeah, oh gosh, <laughs> that's the question, right? Oh my gosh, it was a little bit crazy. So we started off, it was in March, our district closed initially just for two weeks and it was kind of very light. It was kind of like, okay, for the first two weeks, just give them something. So I was posting on, I have a public Facebook page for my students or for families and our principal was like, just do something. So I was just posting on there, whatever. 
the next phase of it, we came up with um, a pretty solid plan, in my opinion. So they basically formed uh, a template that was fairly easy for parents to kind of access and read. And so it had, you know, um, a different section for each subject. And as well as, you know, there were spots for music, art, PE, all that. And we'd upload a lesson plan. And we do that every Friday. And then the students would, you know, be partaking in that in the following week. And we'd be available for support. So it was fairly well uh, managed, in my opinion. And so the challenging part is teaching music, not in person. That was very hard for me. Um, and so I did a lot of research on different elements of technology that I could bring into them that would still be meaningful to them. I don't want to give them fluff. You know, it, it has to be meaningful. But I also wasn't going to be focusing on, you know, these crazy concepts that we do. I'm like, you know what? Bigger picture right now. <laughs> Bigger picture. So, I, you know, I'd set up Google Classrooms and I would try and input videos of myself. Um, you know, and I, I have a YouTube channel, so I vlog. So I tried to incorporate, which they all know about. So I tried to incorporate some of that in there and just have some humor. So I guess to answer your question, it was just a mix of stuff, to be honest with you. And um, I, I, don't, I don't know how successful it was. I, I did, the engagement was tough. It was tough. I would say at best, I probably heard from 20 to 30% of our student population. And we had some students that were off the grid. And so it was just, it was a challenge, but we made it. <laughs> so if it happens in the fall, totally got to revamp it. I would love to do more like recorded lessons, which I know some teachers don't like. I would almost rather do that because at least it can, I can send it to them. Yeah. And with music, let me just go on and play my guitar and like, like I can make it happen. You know what I mean? So it was, it was an adjustment. <laughs> Gotcha. So have you heard what um, the school year is going to look like when you all return it or still up in the air? So it's a little bit still up in the air. So um, initially, Desi was supposed to come out with the guidelines uh, a week and a half ago. So almost before, because we only ended school on Friday. Um, they did not. They pushed out. Uh, so we were so actually should probably check the news. We were supposed to get uh, some information from our governor today, just just about like general guidelines. And I think the Boston Globe listed like a couple of them. I think they were saying like, you know, grades uh, from from second grade up would have to wear masks. Um, they would still have to social distance. Desks would have to be three feet apart. And those are like the only three guidelines we got. So there was nothing else that was really said. So I don't really know like what model we're going to have. I would anticipate, if I would bet money on it, that we'd have a hybrid model, possibly one week on, one week off, like an A and B group for students. So teachers were there full time and there would be some online component, but there's so many factors that go into that. So I don't think we'll be fully remote, knock on wood, like God willing, but we'll see what happens, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. It's going to definitely be a day by day thing because, uh, <laughs> It's one of those things where, like, you see that there's a new surge in cases. And so, like, what happens if this surge is still happening? You know, are we still yeah. going to go with what we, what we committed to a month ago or a week ago or a day ago? So I think it's really in the air for a lot of people. And then, to like, I'm a parent and I have friends that are parents. And a lot of parents are really uncomfortable, too. Because oh, my gosh don't see it like if I don't see something I can't embrace it it's almost like my my little board back there well, you're yes <laughs> see your plan or know what that classroom is going to look like for my child it's really hard for me to get on board so I think you know there are parents that are saying yeah I'm just not comfortable enough yet because COVID-19 is is really a big deal you know considering at this point we still don't know a lot about it yes. and can't cure it or prevent it so it's like you don't want to get it you don't want to get something that no. you know. and then too I was talking to my mom I was like you just don't ever know how it's going to impact you like some people have light symptoms some people be on need uh, ventilators mm -hmm. um, so with that wide span it's just like where would you fall you know whether you had a pre-existing condition or not yes. um, I was in a call-in panel it was via zoom uh, with the local county and one of the veteran teachers uh, she had been teaching for like 18 years she's a little probably like in her late 40s and she was saying she didn't feel comfortable going inside of the building uh, just because of like her age and her health yeah but she didn't want to lose her job either mm -hmm. you know? so I think we have a big population of uh, of teachers in that same boat that are older uh, or maybe even younger like for me 
to know that I have to come home to a four and a six year old and my concern is going to be, am I bringing it home? Are they bringing it home? You yeah. know, it's like an invisible enemy. You don't really know how to fight it. I 100% agree with you. Absolutely. And we've had, you know, we've had some teachers be concerned about that. Um, but we are expecting our district specific, actually, I think statewide, they're expecting 10 to 20% of students are going to be homeschooled, probably the parents are just going to opt not to, you know, I mean, I, it is so challenging for the parents, my heart like goes out to them immensely, I cannot imagine having to focus on childcare. And I, it's just, yeah, it's an invisible enemy. And unfortunately, I feel like there's really no uh, perfect solution for it. Right. Until we get a vaccine. You know what I mean? So and I totally agree with you. I mean, honestly, you know, we're trying to plan and, and, you know, my principal's been kind of spinning his wheels. Understandably, you know, he's like, we have to plan to buy stuff. And it's like, we have no idea. Like, we just don't know. You know what I mean? Like, don't, don't buy anything. You know, he's basically told us, he's like, just don't, like, we can't buy anything. I'm like, listen, my hands are up. Like, it's, you know, I mean, so we'll see what happens. When do you guys go back to school in Atlanta? July so my summer is actually almost what oh my gosh that's crazy that's so funny oh my gosh it's it's weird because in massachusetts we just get out so late like every single year so to me like july i'm like what because we go back in september wow isn't that crazy i know wow that... july 27th oh my gosh how are you feeling ah <laughs> crazy so I want to encourage people that are watching, if you have questions for us or specifically for him, you can go ahead and put them in the comment section so that we can be responding. It's not just a two-person conversation. The teacher circle is open to all. So if you have comments you want to share or if you have questions, go ahead and feel free to put them in the comment section below. Oh, EJ will say that. <laughs> and I love it so much. So. <laughs> so while we're waiting to see if we get any questions, yeah. um, I wanted to talk a little bit about how do you build positive relationship? You say you see K through five, you mm -hmm. see all of the students. So how is it that year to year you, you know, engage and build that community with those students? Oh my, this is my passion, I think. <laughs> I am, everything is about relationships, I believe. Uh, you can't teach kids that don't like you. <laughs> it's very hard, you know what I mean? You really got to build that respect. So my classroom is run in a very, very high energy way. Uh, and it's something I probably need to change a little bit so I don't burn out in five years. And so I have physically a voice. Um, I am extremely high energy there's no there's really I, there is down we have to have peaks and valleys we have many different types of learners and some people take a little bit more time to process we don't want to overstimulate but the minute the kids come in the door i try and greet every single one of them and i mean you know me i'm gonna be like what's up like i you know like we go we go hard when they come in so that's me in class and i just try and put an emphasis on the students and i'm huge on positive reinforcement i'm like look at you girl like look at that you know like i really i try and like hype it up and it just makes them feel good. And I have this theory that I figured out my first year of teaching that it is really easy to make a child feel good. It really, it is not hard. You need to lift them up. That's all it is, you know? Tell them they have worth because they do, you right. know? And look at you, you just improved. It doesn't matter if they didn't get to the finish line yet. Look at you, you just moved a step further. That's awesome. So that's my biggest thing. I do a lot of positive reinforcement and just energy. And I think I just genuinely love what I do. So I think that, that, I think that is, that is part of it. But um, I will say as well, you know, I, and I'm not perfect about this. Sometimes I do, I'm not gonna lie, like on my preps, I do need to like, whew, take a minute, <laughs> you know, but even at the kids' lunches, like I try and pop down sometimes, I walk around, I say hey to them in the hallway, I try to, you know, I've come in for like guest readers in their classroom. So just to try and make any connections outside of my classroom into theirs. Um, I think in a year to year basis, the natural energy occurs, whatever you bring into the classroom, it just gets better and better each year. And the kids the next year, they're like, oh my gosh. And then the next year they're like, oh, and it just, and this year I was like, oh, I was like, I think they're mine. You know, cause the first year was hard. The previous teacher they had was there for 25 years. Not that they were there for 25 years, but still she'd established herself in our district. And the first year it was kind of like, okay, I'm like the long-term sub it feels like. And then the second year it was like, okay. And then the third year I was like, 
this is it, <laughs> you know? So um, the rapport, I think, just kind of happens naturally. And I think when kids are made to feel good because they are beautiful souls and when they are encouraged, um, it goes a long way. They trust you and they want to please you and they want to learn from you. So I guess that's my whole yeah. yeah. That as well. My biggest thing is making making it known that I see them. So mm. like you the minute they come in, I call them by name. Like my biggest mm. challenge to myself is to know their names by the end of the day. Like I don't play with knowing them. Because yes. I want people like I see you and I'm so excited to see you. Like I may not mm -hmm. do the handshakes and the bumps and the hugs. But I'm like, hey, Ashley, how are you <laughs> that in your head? Ready for yes. hey, oh, I love that. So that's it. That's it, though. And you know what? And isn't there something to be said about not just being like, good morning, Ashley, when you're like, Ashley, get out of here. What are you? you know, like just giving her that energy and just the kids get excited. And they're like, oh, my gosh, you love this. You're passionate about this. And they just... And I feel like as a classroom teacher, that must be that trust that you want to build as soon as they walk in that door on that first day. So yeah, I totally agree. Make them feel valued. Valued, yes, yes. Earning so we get one question, and it yeah. is, is your favorite lesson to teach? Ooh. Oh my gosh, no pressure. Okay. I would say my favorite lesson to teach it's actually a unit. Um, it's called Stomp. So it is with an emphasis on using um, kind of regular items you have in your everyday life, whether it be pots and pans, whether it be chairs, anything to make uh, percussive sounds. So um, it's super, the, the kids have said this is typically their favorite. It's fourth and fifth grade. Um, it's so much fun. So we basically, I have them bringing stuff from home. I bring in my pots and pans. Um, they can bring in anything that they want. And the goal is, we keep it kind of simple. They basically have to create one repeating pattern. And then ideally, when we get good, uh, we have one student in each group has a different repeating pattern and you layer it. So one starts and then someone adds on top while the other's going and then someone adds on top again. And before you know it, you're like, oh my gosh. And it's actually kind of simple. So I had some cool ones this year. I had some kids that had chairs that were banging them and they were standing on top of buckets um, and marching on them. And then I have kids that were ripping paper to the beat. Oh. Um, oh, yeah. And then some of them use, oh my God, we got some, there were some creative, they were coming up to me like, can we use a stapler? I was like, just don't staple yourself. But yeah, you can totally, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, so it's fun. I mean, it's different and it really uh, encompasses, um, it just, I don't know, it encompasses a lot of things that we, we try and do. It's a heavy emphasis on performance and um, Stomp the Musical is incredible. I would recommend it to anybody who's watching. It is hysterical. There's a newspaper skit that is so funny. They do a whole percussive, uh, basically segment with literally newspapers. They're ripping the newspapers and they're tapping the newspapers. So it's, it's hysterical. And the kids always love that. So yeah, I would say that's my favorite lesson or, or unit to teach. Okay, and so what curriculum do you use? Oh, great question. Okay, so I, uh, for the past two years, ha well, okay, technically for the past year, I would say, have used the Quaver curriculum, if any uh, music teachers on here know of that. Quaver, I'm a huge fan of. Um, I find it to be a relatively diverse curriculum, an inclusive curriculum. I think they still have some work to do on that, and that's, I'm sure, going to be evolving. Um, I find it to be very engaging for the students. It's a very, excuse me, a very heavy emphasis on visual uh, examples, which I think is really important. I think a lot of kids, we, we <laughs> discount that they are visual learners. So a lot of visual examples, a lot of games, and then some really awesome songs that I feel like are modern and fun that the kids enjoy. Um, but we only had a trial for a year. And we don't really have a lot of money right now, so I'm a little nervous. I don't think that's going to be happening for next year. But I think I'm going to try and write a grant and see what happens. But yeah, I use Quaver and then any other music teachers, I use uh, Music Play as well. I bought that series, which I don't like quite as much. But yeah, so Quaver's great. And then I just think of some other stuff, you know, <laughs> along the way. You know, like, is that um, written by like a Massachusetts company or is it like, Oh, good question. Okay. So yeah, so Quaver is based out of Nashville. Um, yeah, so I believe it's throughout the country. And I think even internationally it might be used. Don't quote me on that. I'm not sure. <laughs> but I think it's definitely throughout the country. I know uh, another one of my uh, colleagues on here, actually Chelsea from Teaching in Pearls, um, who's in our, our group. Um, 
she uses Quaver as well, and she loves it. So it's 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 amazing. It's very expensive. It's a year to year subscription, which is tough. So I'm gonna do my best to get as much as I can of that this year from a grant or something. But yeah, it's it's an awesome resource. It's fun and just anything fun. I really don't like anything traditional, to be honest with you. So. Right. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. I like that. Um, I like that you're like you. You said it, and I didn't kind of like pick on it the first time you said it, but mm -hmm. just love what you do, and I think that's really what makes all the difference. And I also think that's how you attract people to your field. I think sometimes teachers get labeled with a lot of things that are negative. Mm -hmm. I don't think that we always see the on fire teachers as much as we see the burnout teachers. I think Instagram does a good job of, you know, showing the, the cute stuff. Oh, yeah. <laughs> YouTube as well. And Pinterest, I think teachers have taken over Pinterest. But, <laughs> yes, they have. Um, inspiring that next generation. I think that, you know, if you're not on fire about what you do, I don't think you can be effective. So I do believe in my hearts of hearts that you are effective because it's contagious, you know, like positivity is very much contagious. And then, you know, students are going to be like, man, I would like to do that when I grow up, you know? Absolutely. No, I totally agree with you. And I think, I mean, kids, kids can feel, kids, kids pick up on energy. We don't give them enough credit. They really can pick up on things. I really, I, you know, and, and it's, I don't know, like, we've all had those days I feel like where we walk in and we're just like off our game it's happened to me many times and I just have to like check myself because I'm like the kids will feel it you know um but I agree with you I think positivity goes a long way and it's like you said it's infectious right and the I mean it's easy for kids to get excited I, I really think it is you just put you, you need to just be engaging and just like and it doesn't mean you have to be like wild the whole time but it's just it's I think just loving what you, yeah, just loving what you do, showing an interest and showing a passion. I mean, how, like, who could turn away from that? You know, I'll learn anything if someone's passionate about it. I will listen. I really will. So, yeah, <laughs> is it no different? <laughs> and I think, too, like, for me, I am such a behavior, behavioral analyst. Like, I really analyze my students and I try to learn their personalities mm -hmm. and I try use that information to guide like the books I pull, the music that we listen to in the class. Like I really just try to turn it into like their zone so mm -hmm. that they feel even more invested in, you know, not just knowing their name, but you know, if I see that a big population of my kids, they love um, dinosaurs or cars or um, one year I taught sixth grade, they were very much like rap music. And it was one of those years I didn't know any rap songs i didn't know <laughs> any rap <laughs> just one of those rap years <laughs> their challenge and the way that we built relationship that year was like okay guys what's the song you like who is it by and i'll try to find the clean version you know <laughs> that's how we would you know just a kind of little windows of like really knowing them and then putting them inside of the curriculum and then they have no problems engaging with it because it's something that is of interest to them Absolutely. And I think, you know, you said it before, too, and I love this, um, allowing the students to be heard. You know, they, they need their opinions heard. They're going through things. They think they're humans. <laughs> they're intelligent people. They deserve to be heard and their opinions have say, you know, I don't I don't like the traditional, you know, format of like you come to school and you do this. It's like, yeah, let's make it a conversation. You know, I mean, we are teachers. Like, we're the leaders. But absolutely. We need our students to be heard. So I love that. So how easy, how easy is it to be a teacher in math? It's like, I was just, you know, I just talked about inspiring um, teachers, but is that something that's um, made like a difficult process? Is it really expensive? Like, what do you have to have? Yeah, so I, so I guess for a little background, I went to school in New York State, uh, in upstate New York, and uh, I loved it up there. It was, it was nice. Um, and in New York, you have to, to <laughs> if you're, if you guys are in the comments below and you had to do this, let me know, uh, the NTPA. So the NTPA, woo, the NTPA, we had to do that in New York state and we all had to do it. And I knew I was going to be moving back to Massachusetts. And I was like, okay, well, if I could like, like not do it because I'm going to be moving and not pay the money, like the four or 500 or however much it is to do that, that'd be great. 
we had to do it to finish our degree in New York. So that couldn't happen. But anyways, um, so I guess I had to factor that in. So in Massachusetts itself, you have to graduate from an accredited program. You do not have to have your master's. You get your uh, initial license and that lasts for five years. And then within those five years, you have to start your master's. And if you do within those five years, I don't know what like the call for starting is if it's like 20% of your master's, whatever it is, then you get your professional license after five years. In terms of getting your initial license, you have to take for music, we have to take three MTELs, which are just the state tests. Um, so I take uh, the music MTEL um, and then I do the, um, oh my gosh, it's like a reading and writing subset of like a comprehension. So I, I'm not sure what it is, but it was a situation. Um, so we have to take those three and then I believe when you get those three, then then you pass. And you know, you have to bring in your transcripts from your college. So it wasn't too crazy. It's a little bit of a money game, to be honest with you. But um, there's some teachers in different states, and I'd be curious if it's like this in Georgia, that have to go through almost like a teacher, like a full year of a teacher preparation program after they finish their bachelor's. Mm. Again, like, right? I was like, no. Yeah, because we didn't have to do that either. We just had to, yeah, as long as we student taught, that was, I think, pretty much good. And I think there's some teachers that have even taught that maybe did not student teach. So it's not too bad. Um, I've heard that Massachusetts is tricky to get certified in. I think the tests were challenging. So perhaps that's why. But I think the tests in most states are pretty comprehensive. So it's, it's not, it wasn't, I didn't have too crazy of an experience. I will say classroom teachers definitely have to take quite a few more. Um, there's a lot of specialties that they have to get certified in. Um, so yeah. It's not too bad. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing is, it was um, announced earlier, well, probably in the either in the later part of last week or in this week, Georgia will will no longer do Ed TPA or require Ed TPA. Um, I don't know if that's because of COVID nineteen. I think it has something to do with COVID nineteen. I don't know. There's a lot going on in the world. Hey. <laughs> they also waive TEKS, which is our uh, teacher evaluation. You have to get three observations throughout the year. They waive that for the upcoming year. And they also waive uh, standardized testing for the upcoming year. Right. And, <laughs> and that they are evaluating the effectiveness of uh, high stakes testing. And they're not sure if they're going to bring back that specific way of assessments even after uh, 2021. So I'm hoping, like, my goal, like, what I would love to see, and I know nobody cares, but I'm going to say it anyway. I would love to see assessments in a, introduced in a multi-intelligence way. Like have a test for testers, have a test for visuals, have a, taste, a test for orals. Like whatever the way that child takes in the information, I think we need to push it out the same way. You get what I'm saying? I know what you're saying. Yes. <laughs> have a, a clearer um visual of who gets what if we did it that way versus it by saying okay everybody has to take it this way and then they get anxiety or they don't eat or i mean there's just so many factors to test that i just it just i always get so nervous i feel so bad for children because it's just oh too gosh. who is there anyone that is a good test taker <laughs> like tests are awful like oh my god i i 100 percent hear what you're saying i don't know why that's not i mean that that's brilliant like, I mean, literally, everyone takes in information in different ways. Why would we not test them in that way? Ah, why? Now thinking. That's crazy. I mean, I was never for standardized tests, ever. I did all, I mean, even just as a high school student, I did awful on the SATs. I do not think it was a measure of my intelligence at all. And it's embarrassing for kids when it comes back and it's a representation of their, their intelligence right there. Versus right. it's like, nope, we could have done this in a different way. So, right. oh. Yeah, that's huge. I, you know what? Hearing, I think we're paused enough right now in the world. I, I do. Where I think we have a mo moments to really reflect on a lot of these practices. And I think with COVID, the silver lining is that we are starting to reevaluate. Like, was this even effective in the first? Like, we can't do this now because of what's happening. But why did we do it in the first place? You know what I mean? So I hope I agree with you. I really, I hope those questions start to happen. And I think that maybe this is the time for teachers to really be advocating, you know, yeah. because perhaps people are listening, so. Yeah, yeah. and that's what I hope as being the message of just 2020 is let your voice be heard. 
I feel like if teachers stick together and they, you know, say, this is what we believe, this is what we need, um, and nobody bends, we could get a lot done. If you feel like in your county, when you go back, whenever that date is, they don't have enough PPE for your comfort, don't just go in there. Because mm -hmm. if you go in there, then that's saying, I agree to these terms, and they won't get better. Don't let somebody promise you, you mm -hmm. know, oh, the masks are coming in two weeks. Okay, call me in two weeks. You mm -hmm. get we have to be firm about what we need because every other profession gets it. You get what I'm saying? Absolutely. Like, and I said it in my last one, I'm going to say it again. You know, police officers are saying, how dare you, you know, think about defunding our profession and expect the same level of security and performance. But they do it to so many other professions, including teaching. So somebody put in my comments, if, if cops had to purchase their own bullets, they would think before they shoot. Because I know when it comes to white markers and Sharpies, like I think about before I use them, like how much is this really going to take? Because I got to replace it myself because of our budget. You get what I'm saying? I care what you're saying. I, yes, absolutely. That is huge. You know, I saw, I was in a restorative justice workshop the other day and they had a quote that was phenomenal to me. And the quote was, what would happen if the world was full of courageous people? Mm -hmm. And it reminds me of what you're saying right now. If we are firm and every teacher is firm and uses their voice, change would have to be made. I'm not saying a full on like strike, although, you know, but you know, I mean, but like legitimately, if, if we used our, and every single teacher spoke up and said, no, this is what needs to happen. I mean, change would happen. We resist change by just going with the flow, but we have to stop it and it is possible. So I hear what you're saying. I mean, I, I, I like that motto for 2020, let your voice be heard. That is, that is it. So yeah, I agree. I agree with all of that. Yeah, because if we're going to be changing things, we might as well change some things within education that yes. aren't necessarily for the betterment of our students. And nobody knows that more than the teacher that is inside of the classroom. Yeah. And <laughs> I have a lot of teacher friends, so we have a lot of teacher conversations. And I told my friend, I feel like administrators, after they administrate for five years, they need to go back to the classroom for at least a semester because they continue to know what is relevant within the classroom. So it's not to be seen as a demotion, but it's just to be seen as a time to still stay relevant minded. Like Absolutely. what is what do we face today? Because I think a lot of times administrators get so um like their mind is so up here that they don't really get that the requirements and the tasks that they're asking us to do, you know, they don't really get that I can't do that in two weeks. I need two months. Or that doesn't work for uh, lower level thinkers or this is only like a gifted thing. Like there are just so many components sometimes. And so I think it would be beneficial if every now and then they served back in the classroom and got smart. Absolutely. That it. Yes. <laughs> yes. Times a thousand to that. I, you know, I was talking about that with a friend as well. And there are a lot of administrators that are extremely disconnected. And oftentimes I think we look on the forefront of like a behavior piece um, and sometimes are a little bit um, not really on the same page with the teachers of what might work, what might not work, whatever. But it's so much deeper than that. And I agree with you. It's like old practices that it's just like they hold on to and they're like, nope, this is how it was in, you know, 1990. So let's keep it. It's like, no, <laughs> you know, so I, I think that's amazing. Every five years, because you know what? I would say within those five years, things change. Absolutely monumentally yeah. so no i think that's amazing but i think <laughs> that would be incredible seriously yeah yeah I'm for it. like i'm all for positive change there are there are things that work wonderful within our profession but i do feel like there are things especially more so on the teacher care side um i think that sometimes it's be, it's taking advantage of that our heart is so much for our students that we'll do anything you know and so that's kind of like the weapon in their back well, we know they want to be in their classrooms, so they're not going to, you know, quit, you know. Right. They, they try to push it as far as they can. 
but I, I, I kind of am concerned a little bit about the coming school year. Because um, another question that I had was, if we have 10 days, you know, I have, I think we get four days sick and maybe like six days personal every year. I can't remember. But I think, I know in my district, you have 10 days that you can claim it for something so that you still get paid. Okay. But if I get COVID from teaching inside of the classroom and I have to quarantine for 14 days, I'm now negative four days. So are you going to take that out of my pay? Or like, does that impact my personal sick days? Yeah. That, you know, like these are questions I don't hear anybody <laughs> talking about. No, it's valid. I just thinking about it. Right. No, that's huge. Do you guys have a union? No. You do? Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. It's, I, I, some of the unions I feel like are going to have some work cut out for them for sure with this. Cause it is, you're right. I mean, it's tough. We've been thinking about that too. Our district initially in the spring when this was happening, they were like, if you have symptoms, stay home, you will not be penalized for it. Um, which was good, which was encouraging. So I would hope that something like that would happen. I can't imagine it wouldn't happen. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, so I hope that something like that would happen, but I hear you. There's a lot of factors to consider and it's scary. Yeah. No. So. So we're about to wrap it up because we're like at 747. Time goes really quickly when you're on a live. It really does. That did not feel like 47 minutes. <laughs> that felt so quick, but we also had great conversations. So it was awesome. If you have any questions that you would like for Tay to answer or myself to answer, go ahead and put them in the questions um, below. There's actually like now a little question box. I don't think people know about it, but if you put the question in there, then it could be displayed and it's like really cute. Either way, it goes. Ooh, I like that. We like the cute stuff. I know. Instagram, you know? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, as we're waiting, what is like one goal for the upcoming school year? What's your goal? Oh, an inclusive curriculum. Yeah, 100%. I am shifting everything. And I also need a restart. I need a restart. I, my first year of teaching, I reinvented the wheel every week. I did a lot of work. My second year was a little bit more comfortable when I was still reinventing. And this year was smoother for me. It felt a little bit maybe a little bit too comfortable for year three. So no, I'm going to work on getting um, like LGBTQ texts into the classroom. I do want to start reading more in my class, even though we're a music classroom, like with the younger kids, especially peaks and valleys. And sometimes we need a moment to regroup and that's fine. Um, and then I'm going to be looking at, you know, I mean, essentially have to like decolonize the music room. So <laughs> we're going to be doing all of that stuff. So I'm going to be doing a lot of work over the summer for that. And so we'll see, but yeah. Okay. And if there was one piece of advice that you could give teachers for the upcoming year, or even just for like the summer, because there are teachers like yourself that have just stepped their foot into the summer boat. Mm -hmm. So like, what would be that one advice that you give? Well, I would say really evaluate your practice right now. There's a lot going on in the world and this is a really important opportunity to change what you're doing. And it's not about being a better person. It's about making the world a safer place and it's about really educating your students properly and setting them up truly for success and like dismantling this entire system that we have right now. So I would just encourage all educators to just reflect. I think reflect over the summer, look at what you have, look at pockets of where you could add things. Are you missing something in your curriculum and add in? And I wouldn't say do everything over the summer. I have to get out of that mindset. I think that's a very first year mindset of I have to do everything. I think yes. it's okay to do things as you go, but I would say for the year as well, reflection is going to be key this school year. I think it's necessary. Yeah. And I agree. That I'm a bit advocate for if we do what we're supposed to do in the classroom, mm -hmm. we have the power to change the next generation. Like we Absolutely. can really rebuild communities. Mm -hmm from our school. Um, and so I just, I, what I would love to see more, I'm really big about community inside of the classroom and out. I'm big for people to get to know the communities that they serve. You'll be amazed how many teachers don't live in the communities that they serve. They literally hop in, they call, hop in their car, drive to their school and exit out without ever stopping at uh, restaurants or stores and things of that nature. And so I think sometimes it's a disconnect um, between seeing 
those students for who they really are because you can walk in their shoes. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really big about getting to know the community that you serve. And I would love if during this time, we embrace that. Like we partnered with our communities. I know before we were talking about, um, you know, how are we going to return back to the school in the fall and how that could impact childcare. Well, if schools communicated with their local daycares and said, hey, this is the schedule that we're thinking about. Do you offer a service that could hold this number of students or um, could you come up with a system where we could house kids or, you know, we do staggered arrival, you know, partnering with those businesses, partnering with those um, daycares, then anything is possible when you partner with people and you open up your mouth and practice clear communication. But I think because so much is kind of like, don't say, don't say, we don't know, we don't know, then guess what? Nobody can help you. I don't know you're hurting unless you tell me that you're hurting. I don't know you need help unless you say, I need help. And it would be a great benefit to parents if they knew, okay, well, um, I can do the A-B week schedule because the local daycare has committed the week off so that I can continue to work. And then parents would get that comfort that they need to release their children to us again. Because like right now, parents are like, mine, mine, mine. Yeah. No, that's huge. I love that community outside of the classroom as well. That is, that's major. That is honestly huge. And there's so many things that can build that. So yeah, including music. <laughs> outside yeah. performances yes look at that we circled back around <laughs> yes music is key just expression teaching our students how to express the express themselves in multiple ways like i can't wait for my son to learn he's my youngest i make this face every day <laughs> cute mad face but like i literally like Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> kind of backs off a little, but he doesn't know how to express himself yet. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out like, what is your outlet, sir? Like, mm -hmm. is it going to be a sport? He loves music. He loves to sing. It's so cute. Like he'll be singing. He's like, "Mommy, do you hear me?" I'm like, "I hear you." Yes, I love that so much. <laughs> it would be heartbreaking if he went to a school that didn't offer music because. I think that would probably be the one safe place that he could connect with. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> you say leave Ethan alone. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Ethan is my parents out there, you understand. Like I have my daughter who is like she's easy. She's my easy child. Mm -hmm. And then I have my son, and it's like, dude, I don't know if it's because I'm a girl and he's a boy, and we, we really do think different ways. Yeah. We really do. Yeah. It's, it's, it's almost exhausting trying to figure him out. I'm like, dude, I don't get you. Just I stay alive. Will you live through it? Excellent. Oh, my gosh. I love that so much. <laughs> All right, guys. So I want to thank you so much for your time. You are always welcome to the teacher circle. I would love to come back. Thank you. Yay! I love your energy. I love your energy. Oh, you know, I gotta keep the energy going. It's 83 degrees in my apartment right now, so I am what? But you know what? We're making it work. <laughs> <laughs> that is hilarious. Well, I'm actually probably gonna do a poll towards the um, July, because I usually do the teacher circle in June and July, and then once I go back to work, I don't do it anymore. But I am thinking about maybe seeing if people want me to continue it into the school year. <laughs> <laughs> This would be amazing. Oh my gosh. People would need, it, this is so, I love this type of talk though. And I feel like it's especially needed throughout the year. Like people could decompress, come on and be like, oh my gosh, so like what's going on? You know what I mean? That'd be amazing. Yeah. Maybe we'll have a, a sip and stay, like get your, your cup and I don't know. I sip on coffee. Okay. I sip on coffee. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's and that's valid. That's valid. I can but coffee. whatever in you all's cup, you know. <laughs> But maybe why I do like a sip and say, and that'll be like really cute. That would be super cute. Look at that. Already <laughs> All right, then. Thank you guys for joining in. It will be available in my IGTV. I am going to share it with Tay. He could put it in his story, and I'm going to have it in my story. Thank you for coming out. I do have another guest next week, and you all will be seeing those promos.
if you would like to be a guest, I am not the kind of person where it's like you can't reach out to me. Huns, hit me up in my DM <laughs> and I would love to chat with you on the teacher circle. No profile is too big, no profile is too small. Everyone is welcome. Um, guys, continue to have a great Thursday. Thank you for showing up, Tay. Thank you so much, Monet. It was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> bye, guys. All right, bye, everybody.